Okay, switching into another area. Uh, international relations. What does colonialism mean? Well, like any term of about human affairs, it covers a vast range. There's all kinds of colonialism. I mean, the, the worst kind of colonialism is uh, what's called settler colonialism, like the United States or Australia or Israel now to a lesser extent. A settler colonialism like the United States and Australia means you exterminate the indigenous population, maybe not 100%, but you know, pretty close. So that's the absolute worst kind of colonialism. That's us. Uh, there's other kinds of colonialism which are less extreme. So take what we were talking before about Wilson and Haiti and Clinton and Haiti. Okay, it's a form of colonialism in which you effectively uh, uh, take over the country for your own benefit, get as much as you can out of it, uh, drive the population into, uh, destroy the agricultural system, drive the population into cities, uh, all for the most benign reasons, you know, kind of great economic progressive reasons. Uh, and you end up with, uh, say, the earthquake that just happened. That's another kind of colonialism. Uh, other kinds are, and there's many other kinds. Um, so, you know, say, take, take the U.S. and the Philippines, which happened to be an innovation in imperial history. Uh, the U.S. invaded the Philippines in the, about a century ago. Uh, it uh, killed a couple hundred thousand people. It was vicious racism. I mean, these guys, unbelievable racism. They weren't even, people here weren't even sure whether the Filipinos were humans or apes. They were exhibited in uh, international fairs and that sort of thing. I mean, it was just horrendous when you look back at it. Of course, all for the most noble reasons were uplifting them, Christianizing them, you know, giving them civilization, the usual stuff. Uh, there were scattered opponents, people like, not unknown people like Mark Twain. He wrote very sardonic and cutting anti-imperialist essays. Now he wasn't hanged, he didn't have his brains blown out, but they were suppressed. Uh, they, in fact, they, I think they finally came out around 20 years ago in some scholarly edition that nobody ever read, Syracuse University Press. Uh, but they were there, there was an anti-imperialist league, but it just, all right, now what happened after you conquered it? That was the innovation. This has just been studied in a really magisterial book, great book by Alfred McCoy, who's a historian of the Philippines, among other achievements. Uh, he's the first person to have studied in detail how they dealt, dealt with the population after they'd more or less, you know, still haven't totally conquered them, still going on, but uh, pretty much sort of pacified the country. Well, it turns out there was a major innovation in imperial history, which had a lot of consequences right till today in the Philippines and everywhere else. Uh, what was instituted was a very sophisticated, uh, high-tech control and surveillance system. Now, the technology of then was not the technology of now, but it existed. You know, telegraph, radio, other surveillance techniques. Every technique was used that was available to try to control, monitor, subdue uh, uh, the uh, population. Uh, there were also pretty sophisticated techniques of uh, undermining resistance that were used. So co-optation of elites, uh, uh, spreading rumors, you know, uh, using every device you had to try to undermine uh, the uh, nationalists, and uh, it, was, it was done very well. And of course, there's a mailed fist. In the background is the Philippine constabulary, uh, the, uh, something which happens in every in colonial imperial system. You have a, you know, kind of a paramilitary force of collaborators uh, which should do what you tell them, and they're usually trained killers. So, And you can set it up, so let's say you pick people from one tribe to kill another tribe, or you know, use the rural population to smash the urban population. It's done in various ways. Uh, in fact, we do it right now. Uh, this minute, that's the way uh, the U.S. is hoping to run the occupied this Palestinian territories. There's a U.S. Arm, U.S. run army that's supposed to subdue them, and it's highly praised by Obama and Kerry and the liberals and so on. So, uh, anyway, this array of techniques was worked out with in, in quite impressive detail and applied in a very sophisticated fashion. 
Uh, it still applies. Philippines is still pretty much under this system. Uh, the Philippines, which remains a kind of a quasi-colony, is the only part of East and Southeast Asia that has not been part of the so-called economic miracle. You know, the, take a look at Taiwan, South Korea, you know, even Indonesia and so on. There's been a lot of economic development, not the Philippines. They're pretty much under this system. That's the one part of the region that we still run. And it, there was an immediate blowback. Uh, Wilson and the British during the First World War used a lot of these techniques domestically, uh, consciously. Uh, could apply them at home too. Now it's extreme. So you go to Britain, and it's a surveillance society. You know, cameras on every street corner, you know, the allegedly anti terror devices. I mean, here too, you know, Patriot Act. Is, so it's, it's a very, these are, and the US applied them in other countries right away. So Haiti, Dominican Republic, you know, Nicaragua. Well, that's another kind of colonialism. And a very, uh, it makes a lot more sense than occupying the country. It works much better, it's cheaper, it, uh, it can work very effectively. In the Philippines, it's 100 years, you know. It applies back, it develops techniques to apply back home for controlling and subduing populations and breaking them up and so on. Well, that's another kind of colonialism. So in, in any event, to get back to your question, there's no answer to what is colonialism. It's just one form in which powerful systems subdue others, and they subdue their own population. There's nothing new about that. I mean, that was pointed out by Adam Smith. Like, you know, he's not a fool. I mean, what he pointed out and what the international affairs specialists don't seem to understand is that you want to understand how a country works you cannot ignore the domestic distribution of power. Uh, he said, he's pointed out in the Wealth of Nations, you want to understand England, which is his concern. You have to recognize that the architects of policy are merchants and manufacturers. And they set policy up so that their interests are very well dealt with, even though the impact on the people of England may be grievous. And of course, elsewhere it's even worse. What he called the savage injustice of the Europeans is a horrible. It's basically a truth, an enduring truth about uh, well, the power systems. The British Empire in yeah. India, the cost of. There was a cost to the British Empire. Born by the population. By the populations there and by the population of England. Born by the population and the population of England, who were also kind of colonized. And redistribute the wealth. Yeah. So it's a class war, you know. Okay, that's, that's true, and that's true for just about every imperial conquest. And as I say, the most extreme form is just extermination, like settler colonialism. Okay, at the other end of the spectrum, in the best sense of the word, uh, what do you think internationalism means or implies or constitutes? Internationalism should be what, uh, you know, what has always been at least the terminology of the left. I mean, unions are called internationals. I mean, not because they are internationals, but because they ought to be. And their, interna their initial formulate creation was motivated in part by the idea that we ought to be concerned with uh, working people and peasants and other oppressed people around the world. Solidarity, international solidarity was the core ideology of unions. The internationals that were formed are called internationals because that's what they were supposed to be committed to. Uh, the World Social Forum today, uh, which is about as close as there is, is uh, you know, gathers. Uh, I mean, if we weren't so totally you know, caught up in crazed ideology, we'd call the World Social Forum the one pro-globalization group in the world. I mean, it's, it's not Davos, where you get a bunch of rich people talking about how to enrich yourselves, which is called globalization. Uh, the World Social Forum, with all of its defects, you know, brings together uh, people from all over the world, you know, all walks of life, uh, mutually interacting, you know, the, the people, women, hand, giving seeds to each other, you know, supportive ideas about how to improve the global world for the vast majority, okay, that's internationalism. Um, so we should be doing. Uh, Anti-imperialism is a form of internationalism. 
Uh, when do you think it's right, okay, for an individual in the United States to denounce human rights violations in another country as compared to when do you think it's either hypocrisy or interference? Now I'm talking individual, not the government. Well, you know, if, I mean, there are, again, it's a question of priorities. Right. Uh, and priorities. I'm not saying how much time you should put into it. How much, well, when is it literally you know, if, there are human, or if a, there are a human rights role. violations somewhere, it makes sense to criticize them. Period. It makes sense to criticize them if you can do something about them. If you can't do anything about them, it's just uh, posturing. Uh, but if you can help uh, human rights activists or oppressed people or whatever somewhere else, sure, you should do it. Uh, the question is always priorities. Time and energy are finite. Can't get around that. And the question is, how do we compare? Uh, how do we decide how to distribute our energies when there are human rights violations? And there are very clear criteria for that. Uh, they are almost 100% violated, but they're extremely clear. Uh, what, you do, what you prioritize is what any moral human being does the predictable consequences of your own actions. That's what should be prioritized. I mean, somebody else's actions, yeah, I can criticize them, but there's no particular moral value to it, if, unless I can somehow improve things. Uh, the one thing you can improve is what you are doing. So overwhelmingly, our priority ought to be our own engagement in human rights violations, uh, which we can change. Uh, and uh, incidentally, that's kind of independent of scale, uh, even if the ones we're carrying out are not so terrible and the ones that somebody else is carrying out are awful, but we can't do anything about it, then elementary morality says let's focus on ourselves. Uh, the practice is almost the reverse, almost 100% the reverse. And furthermore, it's kind of irreversible. I mean, this great pleasure taken in the crimes of others, especially if we can't do anything about them, if some enemy, particularly if it's an enemy, if some enemy commits horrible crimes and we can't do a thing about it, it's just irresistible to posture heroically about their crimes. For one thing, it's costless because you can't do anything about it. And for another thing, it shows how noble you are. Uh, another thing is you can lie like a trooper. You can say anything you want. And if uh, anybody say, says, well, man, maybe that's not quite accurate, you can come back and say, oh, you're a genocide supporter. You know, you're in favor of Holocaust. So it's the whole stream of techniques is available. So it's just perfect. And intellectuals just love it, you know. And in fact, you see it all over the place. I mean, there's even uh, a new literary genre that developed in the last 10 or 15 years, which is very highly respected. And that is castigating ourselves for not criticizing strongly enough the crimes of others. That's, that's just marvelous. For one thing, you're criticizing ourselves, so look how moral you are. Uh, and you're criticizing ourselves for not doing enough about the crimes of enemies, which we can't do anything about. And in fact, if you look at the literature on this, it's, it's, sh it's astonishing. I mean, it's carried out like almost to a T. It's like a caricature of itself. And the people are nice people. Actually, I know some of them. You know, perfectly nice people, perfectly decent. They think we ought to really sacrifice ourselves, you know, and castigate ourselves for not doing enough about, uh, say, uh, Pol Pot's genocide, which there was no suggestion about what to do about. Uh, but meanwhile, totally ignore everything we're doing. Totally. Uh, another international kind of concept and issue, self-determination. What's, what does it mean? What sort of right is self-determination? And what, under what circumstances are people to ex uh, entitled to exercise the right, and conversely, when are people not entitled to exercise it? Right. Again, like most things, I don't, think you can give a, I don't think you can give a blanket answer. It depends well, on circumstances. What are the, well, you know, at, I mean, you know from, from one point of view, everybody has a right of self-determination, right. like you have a right to control your own life, right. just like individuals do. On the other hand, self-determination is not done in isolation. It has consequences for others. Okay, so you have to take that into account. Then you have to start balancing things. So like take, um, say, secession in the South, in the United States. Uh, should Southerners have the right of self-determination? Well, who was asking for self-determination? White Southerners, not black slaves. 
So it wasn't that the South was asking for self-determination. On the contrary, a large part of the population, which didn't have a voice, uh, was opposed to self-determination for the white masters. Uh, there are lots of other questions, and the same is true in every other place. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, you pick the case that you find a complexity of considerations, and you have to kind of uh, work your way through them. But I do not see how there can be formulas about this, because self-determination, while a value, is only one of many values. And as in human affairs generally, values often conflict. Do you have views about uh, international structures, new international structures, that might better protect you know, the weak, the poor, uh, people who are subject to violations, starving, uh, imposed upon, etc.? Actual institutional structures that could, you know. Interesting, but I'm pretty much in the mainstream of American public opinion on this. Uh, totally different from elite opinion or anything that's articulated. But if you look at American public opinion, which I've, I've written about it, and you kind of reviewed the polls, and they're pretty standard and consistent, but nobody really doubts them. Uh, considerable majority of the public, quite a large majority, think that the United Nations, not the United States, ought to take the lead on international crises. A uh, majority of the population think we ought to give up the veto at the Security Council, and everybody ought to, and just follow the will of the majority, even if we don't like it. Uh, and, you know, it continues like this. Like, say, uh, I haven't seen a poll recently after the huge propaganda offensives of the last couple of years, but two, two years ago, you know, before the huge propaganda offensives, about, uh, I forget the exact number, but a considerable majority, take, say, Iran, the big issue, considerable majority of the population agreed with almost the entire world that Iran has the right to enrich uranium, as does any signer of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I mean, what we read here is Iran is defying the world you know, by some interesting definition of the world. The world means the, not just us, the government. It means the U.S. government, whoever happens to agree with it. That's the world. It excludes the pop large majority of the population of the United States. It includes the non-aligned countries, which is most of the world, who vigorously support it, and so on. Uh, but yeah, I think they were right. A large majority, I'm still talking about polls two years ago, but now it could be different. Uh, a large majority opposed uh, threats of force against Iran. That is, they opposed the United States being a rogue outlaw state which violates the UN Charter. UN Charter, though nobody will mention it, uh, bars the threat of force in international affairs, meaning everybody in the American political system is a criminal because across the board, it's all options have to be open. Well, the population opposed that. Uh, a, a very large part of the population, I think it was around 80%, uh, thought the United States should l uh, live up to its legal obligation, legal determined by the World Court, to observe the Non-Proliferation Treaty, meaning make good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. That's the last time I saw 80%. Uh, the most interesting vote in this connection, just keeping to the top issue in international affairs, is a huge percentage. Again, I don't remember the numbers, but it was quite large. I thought that we should establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Now, that's, that's the right answer to the pr problems such as they are that are arising. Uh, technically, the United States says, yeah, sure. Uh, but, of course, nothing being done about it. A nuclear weapons-free zone it's a very interesting concept. If you're really interested in non-proliferation, like Obama claims he is, uh, the one thing you'd support is nuclear weapons-free zones. Those are you know, they're small steps, but steps towards reducing the threat of nuclear weapons and proliferation. And the facts are extremely revealing. I'll run through some of them. Uh, with regard to the Middle East, there's overwhelming popular support around the whole world. Uh, the United States and Britain, of course, what that would mean is uh, no nuclear weapons in Iran or Israel or, or U.S. forces deployed there. That would be a nuclear weapons-free zone. That's why it's not even on the agenda, except for the population. Uh, well, it's, it would be an important step. It's feasible, you know, it, inspection procedures, of course, and so on. But it's technically feasible, and it would mitigate, perhaps eliminate, whatever dangers there are. But it's not on the agenda. Uh, also not mentionable 
is that the U.S. and Britain have a very strong commitment to this, very strong commitment. The reason is because of something that is unutterable. Uh, when the U.S. and Britain went to war with Iraq, they tried to provide a very thin legal cover for it. And what they appealed to is a Security Council resolution, 687, from 1991, uh, which called on Iraq to eliminate its weapons of mass destruction. And the story was they hadn't done it, so we had a right to invade. But if you read that resolution, it calls for the establishment of a nuclear-free weapons zone in the Middle East. Uh, so therefore, the U.S. and Britain, way more than any other country, are committed to this. Well, you can't talk about it because it, it, like it, it's like you know, pornography or something worse. You know? But uh, those are the facts. Population supported it, uh, could eliminate problems. It gets much more interesting than this. There are nuclear-free weapon zones in the world. Uh, one was just uh, finally achieved in uh, Africa after a lot of negotiations. Uh, it's being blocked by the United States. The reason is that the African Union, uh, all of it, regards the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean as part of Africa, because it's a, it's a part of Mauritius, which is part of the African Union. Well, Britain, under U.S. orders, uh, kicked out the whole population some years ago, illegally of course, uh, in order to build a big U.S. military base. Uh, so Britain didn't accept the African Union agreement because the master says you can't do it, they're very loyal. The U.S. refuses to accept it. So the U.S. is blocking the African Union nuclear weapons free zone because we insist on keeping a base, a military base, after having kicked out the population for storage of nuclear weapons and crucially for bombing. That's one of the main bases for carrying out aggression in Central Asia and the Middle East. You, know, you bomb Iraq, it comes from there. In fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Navy announced that they're sending a, a big submarine tender to Diego Garcia to service uh, nuclear submarines and so on and so forth. So we're blocking the African Union nuclear weapons-free zone. We're refusing to even talk about the Middle East one, which is critical. And it's more. There's more. There's a South Pacific. There's always more. Hmm? There, it's always more. There's a South Pacific nuclear weapons-free zone, which finally it was held up for a long time by the French, because they wanted to use the French islands for nuclear weapons testing. All right, they finally did their nuclear weapons testing. Now it's being held up by the United States because the Pacific Islands, like Palau and so on, they're used for nuclear weapon storage and for nuclear submarines. So, okay, we're blocking the South Pacific zone. And meanwhile, Obama is giving, you know, highly praised speeches about how awful nuclear weapons are. We've got to do something about it. And there's massive, uh, at least pretended concern, maybe actual concern about the possibility that maybe Iran's developing nuclear weapons and we don't know. You know, if, if anybody from Mars was watching this, they'd be amazed that the species can even go on, you know. How can you do all this without collapsing it with ridicule about yourself? Well, it's easy in a well-disciplined society. I was thinking roughly the same va variant on what you concluded with. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, a, a novelist, there's no such thing as a novelist who is cynical enough and creative enough to come up with a scenario that even remotely approximates the reality for... I mean, the interesting thing to me is that, you know, there are novelists who try to do it, like, say, Heller or, you know, Vonnegut, and they're read, and people laugh. But they don't realize it's the world. They don't realize it's us. Actually, I saw this. Uh, when one of Michael Moore's documentaries, I mean, we never went to the movies, but we did go to one of his doc. I think it was the one about gun, Columbine, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol, my wife, and I went to... Uh, but we decided to go see it in a lower middle class town just to see what the audience reaction will be like. Because they're the people he's making fun of. Well, they were laughing, you know, I thought it was great, you know, making fun of all these guys with guns and so on. They probably all have guns. Uh, they, they thought it was, you know, really funny, well done. But I don't think anybody yeah. I perceived them. Reaction. There's a movie out now called Avatar. It's the biggest movie going. I don't see how it's possible for a human being to look at that and not realize that the 
the thing that's being presented is based on Indochina. And it is, I mean, yeah, it is. It's just clear. And they even took, they even took some film footage and altered it. But you can, if you've seen it all, you can see it. And it's, you know, so it's, a, it's this horrendous critique of imperial kind of attitudes and everything else. The audience absolutely loves it and don't realize it's about Iraq also. I mean, it's, it's just clear. Uh, I don't know about your you're younger than I am, but when I was growing up, you know, I was a radical kid, you know, writing about anarchism, this and that. We were playing cowboys and Indians. Yeah. And we were killing the Indians. You know. I mean, I sort of knew in some corner of my mind that something wrong. Maybe this isn't totally perfect. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, like the other question that I asked earlier, or questions that I asked earlier, the mistakes that you think the anti-war movement um, has made over the years and things that maybe we should have done differently and different approaches that we make, uh, make in the future. Clearly, we've had some successes, uh, even some significant successes, but on the other hand, we've also failed in, in some sense. Well, so what, what do you think we've done that we did that wasn't so wise and things that we should have been doing? I think there are a lot of things that could have been a lot better. Uh, for one thing, sectors of the anti-war movement, and yet we know who they were, are very you know, nice people, all our friends and so on, uh, uh, undertook tactics. If you're undertaking some, you know, always, if you're any kind of an activist, you know, you're picking something you decide to do, you have to make a distinction between two kinds of tactics. Now, you could call them, you know, feel-good tactics, makes me feel good about myself, and do good tactics, does something for somebody else. Well, you know, the anti-war movement dissolved to a large extent into feel-good tactics, which were harmful. In fact, the Vietnamese were aware of it. Like they you know, talked to them. You know, what they liked was quiet, nonviolent demonstrations. You know, a group of women standing quietly somewhere. What they didn't like was what was being done. Uh, say, weathermen. Uh, these are tactics that are understandable from the point of view of the people. They were frustrated, they were bitter, nothing was working. Okay, let's go out and smash some windows. Or let's go out and have a fight in a Third Avenue bar and show the people we're authentic and so on. Well, you know, these are like just gifts to the ultra hawks. They helped build up support for the war. And it was obvious they were going to have that effect. Uh, and a lot of it was that. I mean, a lot, especially as the movement sort of, you know, kind of dissolved into sects, like after 68, a lot of it was that. And so a lot of it was just self-destructive. Uh, the other big error was to stop. I mean, by 1975, end of the war, around 70% of the population uh, condemned the war as fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Those are kind of unbelievable figures, because nobody ever said that. You know, where'd they get it from? You know, what do they even mean? Who knows? Nobody checked. But, you know, that meant there was a huge reservoir of possible support for anti-war activity. It was it dissolved. It left. Everybody went away. Uh, you started condemning the Khmer Rouge or doing some other thing. And, okay, so then comes the Central American massacres, and so it goes on. Now, there are other things. Like, I, uh, I, I have almost nobody, almost nobody agrees with me about this, but my friends on the left, uh, many of them don't even understand my own view, and which goes back to around 1970, that the U.S. won the war. Uh, the business world recognized that, like you read it in the Far Eastern Economic Review. But the left is committed to the doctrine that we won. You know, we stopped the war, the Vietnamese won, the people united, and the rest of it. That's not what happened. We have a rich documentary record, and it's very instructive. We should think about it and be intellectually honest about it. The U.S. didn't go to war in order to conquer Vietnam. In fact, it didn't care if Vietnam That's dropped true. off the planet. Definitely, yeah. you know, I mean, it didn't care. You know. it, but it went to war, war for good reasons. You would, you would think people in the movement would understand that. And, you know, it was kind of always pretty clear, but we have a rich documentary record. In fact, I've had it since about 19, since the Pentagon Papers. They went to war for the usual reasons. The Mafia principle, which is the dominant principle in world affairs. You know, the Godfather does not accept disobedience. It's dangerous. 
uh, if one country gets away with disobedience, no matter how tiny it is, somebody else will get the idea and you know, they'll be disobedient. Pretty soon your whole system erodes. That's basically the, one of the dominant principles in world affairs. Uh, and uh, Vietnam was a case in point. You know, they were afraid that uh, Vietnamese nationalism would be successful. You'd have successful economic development. It would, like, to use Kissinger's terminology, it would be a virus that would spread contagion. So it spread to Thailand, you know, Malaya, Malaysia, and go on to Indonesia. Now you're in real trouble. Indonesia has real resources. Uh, pretty soon, maybe ultimately, Japan, which uh, John Dower, Asia historian John Dower, called the super domino. Uh, Japan would accommodate, was the word that was used, to an independent East and Southeast Asia. It would become its technological and military center, uh, which would mean that the United States would have lost the specific phase of the First and Second World War. Well, you know, 1950, they weren't ready to lose the Second World War. So you got to stop. You got a virus it's spreading contagion. There's a cure. Destroy the virus and inoculate the potential victims. It was done. South Vietnam was pretty much destroyed even, you know, by 1965 and the rest of Indochina not long afterwards would never be a model for independent development. Uh, the surrounding countries were inoculated by vicious dictatorships. The most important was Indonesia, really rich. In 1965 came the Suharto coup, greeted with total euphoria in the United States, you know, killed maybe a million people, uh, destroyed the only mass popular organization, you know, opened the country up to the West. Uh, no more accommodation, you know, no more contagion. In fact, with George Bundy, who was not a total fool, and later he was a national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson. In later years, in retrospect, he said, you know, in retrospect, we should have stopped the war in 65. Uh, he was right. Uh, Vietnam was already essentially destroyed, no virus. Uh, Indonesia, the big prize, is inoculated. You've got a vicious military dictatorship. Uh, our kind of guy, as Clinton called him. Uh, so, you know, Japan's safe, you know, being our size. So what's the point of destroying the rest of the place? It's a waste of time. Okay, I think the, the anti-war movement should understand that because that's a pattern that is followed over and over again. It is a dominant principle of international affairs. It makes perfect sense. It's kind of interesting. It's, it, it, it's sometimes ridiculed, like the domino theory, who believes that, ha ha ha. Uh, yeah, everybody believes it because it's true. Uh, the world's mostly run like the Mafia. And if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the next thing that happens in the world. In fact, that's part of the reason for um, uh, the uh, incredible antagonism to Iran. Uh, why Iran? I mean, there's a terrible government. There's a lot of terrible governments, like Saudi Arabia's a lot worse. Well, they were disobedient. They're not going to let them get away with it. In fact, it's, you know, it's, it's even said. It says, well, they took hostages. How can we let them get away with that? Disobedience. You know. uh, Cuba is a striking example. I mean, for decades, the majority of the population has been in favor of normalizing relations with Cuba. Okay, disregarding the population is normal. The business world is in favor of it and has been for a long time. Big sectors. Energy, agribusiness, pharmaceuticals, you know, really powerful sectors. But we can't do it. We've got to keep punishing them because they were disobedient. And you don't get away with that. When you encounter what you do on an incredibly regular basis, as this discussion reveals, the extent of horror, how do you get through all that and go right back to work again? Actually, going back to work is one of the cures of it. If you can do, if you just, if you can't, if there's nothing you can think of doing, then you just collapse. You maybe you decide to give up or you just go into a deep depression. But if you can keep, you know, if you can keep working, that's a cure. There's an advantage there for you. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't mean just time and access and resources. I mean that you're in a position to feel like when you write, when you speak, even if it's not having a gigantic effect and it's not transforming everything right away, it's perfectly plausible. In fact, you'd have to be a bit delusional to think it was having no impact. Yeah, there are a lot of other people who will feel that what they're going to do is going to have no zero impact. Yeah. Well, and they get crushed. 
I mean, the fact of the matter is, realistically, I know that there's very little impact, but it's for me. It gives me something to do. It gives me something to, you know, feel that I'm, say, doing the right thing. If it reaches some people, okay, good. But it's the same is true of, you know, any organizer. You organize local people to, uh, in a community, to say, uh, get a traffic light where uh, kids cross the street. Let's say that achieves something. It empowers people. Right. Then they go on to the next thing. That's very. There's a difference between a person who works in a soup kitchen and who can clearly see the impact. It's not changing the whole world, but it's having a dramatic effect, often a bigger effect than leftists have yeah. on other people's human lives. And in fact, that's a reasonable question. You know, why should somebody in the United States not give their time and their energy to soup kitchens, to helping the poor, to doing something of that character, well, as compared to yeah. trying to build a right. movement that's going to okay. change the whole well, system? The, the case of a soup kitchen versus organizing the community to get a traffic light. No, organizing an anti-war movement, something well, on a larger scale. Case. Well, let's, let's take a small case. case. Mm. Trying to organize the community to get a traffic light. Now that not only has an advantage, kids can cross the street, but it empowers people. It can get them to understand, yeah, I can do things. It's not hopeless. I can go on. Well, that's uh, a do uh, working in a soup kitchen is great, but doesn't have that effect. Agreed. I understood. But you can see how the choice between social welfare, etc., work and anti-war work, anti-capitalist work becomes a difficult choice for people. Yes. I think that the left is very disdainful and too quick to dismiss people who make a different choice than they make. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't, I certainly don't disdain people who work in soup kitchens. You know, like uh, one of my daughters works for Oxfam. Yeah. You know, it's kind of what it is. You know, you're trying to set up, pro but incidentally, the Oxfam projects that she works for, at least they're designed to be like the getting a traffic light. Yeah. Um, the idea of the project is not just, you know, I'm going to come in and build a well and you can have it. It's to try to get the communities to get started in doing something about their own lives. That's hard, but that's the goal. Okay, over the years you've obviously been subject to intense um, uh, malicious scrutiny um, to people attacking you for all kinds of, of things. Um, uh, they attribute views to you that you don't hold, or they spin views that you do hold in a manner that has absolutely nothing to do with the way you hold them, uh, and so on. You know, I get a lot of, I mean, tonight when I get home, I Let's do them one at a time. I have a couple hundred letters, and it comes all the time. People ask good questions. They say, you know, I read this and that about you. What do you say? And so I say, fine, I'll look at it. In fact, I, I, the, the attacks are of interest in a number of respects. For one thing, there's sometimes tr uh, correct ones. Okay, so I learned something. It's extremely rare, I should say. But there are cases where you yeah, said something the wrong way, or maybe I made a mistake. Fine, I learned, and then I corrected. Uh, but uh, you have to ask yourself, am I getting my head blown off by a elite battalion trained in Fort Bragg? Well, that's what happens in U.S. domains. Is it happening to me? No. Okay, so people, you know, lie and slander and vilify them. It's not exactly the worst thing that can happen. But I'm not so much worried about you. I'm not trying to deal with you here. I'm dealing with, again, the people who read it and are deterred from uh, relating to ideas because of it. You've been slammed about Cambodia, Pol Pot, etc. Um, what were your actual views? Obviously, you can't go through hundreds of pages, but your actual views about Cambodia and Pol, and Pol Pot. Um, and why do you believe they elicited the attacks? First of all, I've been quite interested in this. I mean, it, I didn't write anything myself in those days. I was writing with Ed Herman. Uh, there, there has been a huge literature trying to show something wrong with it. I mean, it's literally the case that nobody has found a misplaced comma. I mean, there you was mean an, in the stuff you wrote about? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was exactly, I mean, it must be the best stuff that's ever written. Because <laughs> anything you write, you know, it's got to be some mistakes. I mean, you read the professional journals, you know, the last paragraph of every review of a scholarly monograph lists the errors, which are always there, you know. Literally nothing. And the reason was explained quite early on. I mean, th what we wrote about Cambodia was carefully checked by some of the leading specialists in the field. And they went through it, you know, they 
corrected some things, you know, changed some other things. So first of all, it's very unlikely that there would be mistakes. Secondly, we didn't claim anything. We claimed almost nothing. We didn't take any position on it. We just said, look, here's the data that's available. Here's what comes out of the doctrinal system. Let's compare them. I mean, the only way, and they said, we don't know what happened. You know, maybe the most, in fact, we said, you know, maybe the most extreme uh, inventions will turn out to be correct. That's not our question. Our question is, let's compare what went in to what came out. Now, the only way you can make a mistake on that is like a logical error. Okay, we didn't commit elementary logical errors. So, in fact, and there were no factual errors, but we just took the data that was there. And this was noticed right away by one of the leading Cambodia historians, David Chandler, right away wrote, you know, look, uh, nothing this is going to stand, no matter what's discovered. Because what you're claiming is so limited that no matter what's discovered later on, it's, never, it's not going to affect what you say. I mean, to the extent that we took a position all, at all, which was little limited, we essentially repeated what U.S. intelligence was saying. And everyone agreed that they were the most knowledgeable source. So, you know, chances are there have never been any errors, and there haven't been. Uh, now, it's very, very, uh, there, remember there are two volumes that South End published, uh, Political Economy of Human Rights. Uh, these two volumes, uh, almost entirely, what they were concerned with was exactly this question. How does the data that comes in relate to the interpretation that comes out? Okay. Uh, almost the entire two volumes are about U.S. crimes. Uh, how does the data that we have about them relate to the, what comes out, which turns out to be apologetics and denial. Nobody has ever mentioned any of that. In fact, we had two major, we did do a little of each side, and we had two major examples. There was a chapter devoted to Cambodia, which we went through in detail. There was a chapter devoted to East Timor, which we went through in detail. It's a very good comparison. The two major atrocities same time, same place, uh, both huge. Uh, uh, one was in the course of an invasion, which is much worse, namely East Timor. Uh, but the main difference between them was that in one case, it was our responsibility, and we could have stopped it right away. In the other case, it was somebody else's atrocity, and we could do nothing about it. There has, I don't think there's ever been a word about the chapter on East Timor, the one that's vastly more important. First of all, it's our crime. It's a huge crime, uh, and we could have stopped it. And therefore, it's silence. I mean, some words of apologetics and denial, okay, but I put aside the just uh, Stalinist types. Uh, mostly, it's just avoidance. On Cambodia, there's been an intense effort to try to show there was something wrong with it. Well, that tells you something. What it tells you is an illustration of what we talked about before. The actual practice of intellectuals gives you an extremely good criterion for what should be done by a person with elementary moral convictions, namely the opposite of what always is done. And here you have a really dramatic example of it. And it com it's continues right to the present. In fact, just recently I happened to answer a couple of these things. And in answering, I pointed these things out. And I also pointed out, look, uh, if you say you're concerned about Cambodians, OK, glad you're concerned about them. Uh, how about being concerned about uh, the new revelations that were just made, which we talked about before, about the scale, the incredible scale of the U.S. attack, which is really incredible, which in fact created the Khmer Rouge, uh, which you say you're upset about. So why don't you say something about that? Uh, the answers are interesting. Not one word about it. It's as if I didn't say it. You know, What comes out, how come you're screaming about the Khmer Rouge? You're not condemning the Khmer Rouge, how come you're a policy for genocide? Okay, that's the reason why. That, that makes sense. You know, like if you're, uh, you know, you're caught with your hand in someone's pocket, you know, change the subject. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the response. But if anyone has a criticism, I'd be glad to hear it. I've yet to see it. And I think the reasons are transparent from things like this. And, and it's not just these two cases, it generalizes. Uh, actually, it, it and I together, and in fact separately, have gone over many such examples, you know, thousands of pages of documentation by now, also responding to the criticisms, like in Manufacturing Consent, our joint book, which was 10 years after all the Cambodia stuff, we reviewed it, 
and we reviewed what actually happened, what was known at the time, what had been discovered since, uh, the criticisms, the nature of the criticisms, we responded to them. Effect? Zero. And nobody can even look at that. Uh, either the people you know, who are kind of like right inside the doctrinal system, or the kind of decent people who you're talking about who want to understand. They wouldn't look at our responses. Right? They wouldn't even know they exist. I mean, the only thing anyone knows about that book is, well, it's, it says there's a conspiracy theory in the press or something. Okay, you already talked about the Kennedy, for which you get slammed routinely because you deny that he was killed by X, Y, and Z. You talked about 9-11, so I won't ask you about that. Uh, you've been slammed about uh, uh, the Mideast, called an anti-Semite, called a self-hating Jew, etc. Yeah, that's that kind of interesting. And that's why I'm asking. Again, what are your actual views, and broadly, and, and why do you think they elicited the attacks that they do, and what is your impression of that? The attacks are quite interesting. Uh, they actually have a long history. Uh, they actually go back to the Bible. Uh, the phrase self-hating Jew it comes from the Bible. Uh, it comes from uh, the book of Kings. Uh, you know, the, one of the epitome of evil in the Bible was King Ahab, you know. Remember that story from when you were in Hebrew school? Uh, king Ahab was the evil king, you know, terrible king and so on. Uh, uh, he, at one point he called the prophet Elijah to him and asked Elijah, why are you a hater of Israel? Okay, well, what did he mean? He mean that Elijah was condemning the acts of the evil king. And the king, like every totalitarian, identified himself with the culture, the society, you know, everything. So if Elijah is condemning his crimes, Elijah must be a hater of Israel. Well, that's the origin of the phrase, self-hating Jew, okay? And it runs through history. In fact, in the modern period, it's very explicit. Actually, Abba Eben, who was an Israeli the diplomat, you know, highly respected, British accent, you know, who's the face to the world, considering a lead, sort of leading liberal humanist. Now, he once wrote an article, it must have been 35 years ago, in the American Jewish Press, Congress Weekly, American Jewish Congress Weekly, in which he described, told Americans, American Jews, what your task is. They said, your task is to show that critics of Zionism, he didn't mean Zionism, he meant critics of the state of Israel, are, fall into two categories, uh, anti-Semites and neurotic self-hating Jews. Okay, covers 100% of criticism, so it's great. Uh, and that's correct. That's the way to cut out 100% of criticism. If it's from non-Jews, say, anti-Semitism. If it's Jews, they're neurotic, self-hating Jews. Uh, he, picked, he actually mentioned two examples, me, of course, and I.F. Stone. I.F. Stone is a dedicated Zionist. You know, he made some cri But the two of us were self-hating Jews because we were criticizing things. Okay, that's uh, Abba Eben gave the game away as King Ahab had given the game away, and plenty of people in between. Actually, there's a kind of a counterpart to that, which somehow nobody seems to notice, and that's the concept anti-American. What do you think the concept anti-American and its use as a criticism of people such as yourself? It's, it's a, it comes right, we're back to King Ahab. Yeah. It's, a sta it's a straight totalitarian concept. It was used in, it's used in totalitarian states, like in the Soviet Union. Um, and the harshest criticism against dissidents was they're anti-Soviet. Okay, so say Sakharov was anti-Soviet because he com attacked the crimes of the Kremlin. Was he against the Russian people? Was he against the Russian culture? Uh, was Solzhenitsyn you know, saying the Russian people are awful? Quite the contrary, he's a Russian nationalist, extreme Russian nationalist. Uh, but they were anti-Russian because they were condemning the crimes of the state. And totalitarian states do identify themselves, it's part of the nature of totalitarianism, uh, with the society, the culture, you know, the people, and so on. Uh, I know of only one f democratic country, more or less democratic country, which has, ad adopts this totalitarian concept. That's the United States. I mean, suppose that somebody in, say, Italy uh, condemns Berlusconi. Uh, they were called anti-Italian. Uh, people would collapse some laughter in the streets. Hmm? 
Italy. Yeah. yeah, he's not an Italian. You know, he's attacking Berlusconi. But in a, in, a, in a totalitarian culture, like Western intellectual culture, if you attack the holy state, uh, you must be anti-American. I don't know of any example other than you know things like King Ahab or the Soviet Union or say the Brazilian military dictatorship. Under the Brazilian military dictatorship, if you criticize torture, you're anti-Brazilian. Yeah, it's a totalitarian concept. What's quite interesting about the United States and England and a large part of Europe is that this totalitarian concept is accepted uncritically with regard to the United States. Um, there are even books by people you know, considered liberal scholars, uh, Paul Hollander at uh, UMass, a respected scholar called the Anti-Americans. Who are the Anti-Americans? Well, you run through the list. It's people who criticize government policy. Okay, if you're a deeply committed totalitarian, so deeply you can't even see it, yeah, that's anti-American. Thank you.